Hi, folks. Uh, my name is Ivan McGrath. I'm one of the uh, research culture team at UCD, and I'm introducing the speakers for this session. We have co-chairs. Uh, it's very exciting. Um, so our first two speakers are uh, Grace Mulcahy and Adrian Otthill. Grace is Research Integrity Officer at UCD, which she combines with her academic work in the School of Veterinary Medicine, where she is full professor of veterinary microbiology and parasitology, working on One Health research product, projects, while Adrian is Deputy Research Integrity Officer at UCD, and he combines that with his academic work in the School of Mathematics and Statistics, where he is full professor of mathematical physics, working on classical and quantum aspects of black holes. Uh, and together, the two of them, along with Jill, Colleen, uh, Sonia, uh, and a number of others, uh, Adrian and Grace have headed up the Research Culture Initiative at UCD the last couple of years. Uh, so they're going to talk to you this morning uh, about that whole initiative and, and process as it's ongoing at this point in time. So I'm going to hand over now to Grace. Thank you very much, Ivor, and you're very welcome, everybody. It's lovely to see such a big interest in research culture uh, in Ireland. And I think we're probably one of the first meetings to have this kind of national conversation, I think, elsewhere in, in Europe and in the UK. So here later, people have been having these kinds of conversations for a little bit longer. So we were thrilled and delighted to have such a big interest in our conference here today. Very much I'm going to just speak uh, from stream of consciousness stuff this morning. No slides or anything else. And Adrian, I'm sure, will, will chime in as appropriate to tell you a little bit about why we started our research culture journey in UCD, what we set out to do, how far we've got, and what we hope to do next. So Adrian and I had been working and doing a double act as research integrity officers in UCD for a couple of years. And I think we would both formed the impression really before we even started the job, that it was much more important and fundamental to do work which was proactive and preventive and trying to prevent less than good research practices and frank misconduct rather than just chasing down and being the, the research integrity police. But of course, you know, a little bit of that happens as well. But we really wanted to focus on the proactive and the preventive end. And in doing that, I think, again, it came, uh, became really obvious to us uh, during the course of our work that very much um, when things went wrong, it wasn't really usually anybody being deliberately evil or bad or setting out to deceive people. It was the small little lapses in personal behaviors, in communication between teams, individuals, and within organizations that led to sometimes things happening which mightn't have happened uh, or shouldn't have happened um, if in an ideal world. For example, we know that when we manage research teams, we do so because we've won a grant and we have certain expertise or we know a bit about a, a subject and have ideas on how to pursue it. But we don't necessarily have training in communications, in management, in leadership. And I think it's some of those deficits, particularly in communications, that can sometimes lead to things going wrong within research teams. And we became conscious very uh, quickly as well that research culture, which essentially embodies the way which we do research, the behaviors we express towards other people who collaborate with us in research, towards our research teams and within organizations, very much affects the outputs, the research outputs at the end of the day. And so research culture stretches all the way from undergraduates who may be doing summer research projects, so we were judging summer research projects last night, through to our graduate students who are full-time researchers, through to the early career researchers, postdocs, and eventually through to our academic staff and research leaders, as well as research management in the organization. And so research culture then is a function of how teams behave, how individuals behave, how organizations behave. And beyond the organizational level, we have, of course, um, influences of our funders because they affect our research culture as well and how they judge us as researchers and as well as that we have research publishers who no doubt I think have a really really big influence on research culture. So we set up to, to try and do something and to see if we could positively inf influence research culture or at least have a conversation about it in UCD. 
So we made a couple of presentations to people in influential positions and to our research, university research committee. And we were very grateful for the support of Orla Feely, our Vice President for Research Impact and Innovation, who's here today. Um, who really, I think, uh, gave us a, a strong encouragement and resources to go ahead and do our uh, initiative in UCD. And what we set out to do was, first of all, to test the water and to measure the temperature of research culture in UCD. So the first thing we did was a survey. So we sent out a survey to all of our research community, which included our research students, our postdocs, our academics, and as well, those of us who are in research teams, but not perhaps at the PI level. So we included our research technicians and our professional research staff as well, our research support staff. And we had a really good response, I think, especially in view of the, the survey fatigue that we all feel from time to time. Um, and you'll hear more about the outcomes of our survey later today in, in Colleen's presentation. We followed up that survey with a number of focus groups, which we called World Cafes, and they were modeled on Welcome Trust's initiative in the research culture space. And that gave us deeper insights, I think, into some of the themes that emerged from our survey. Uh, we did some other things as well. We piloted a 360 degree voluntary uh, review process for those uh, researchers who manage sizable research teams. That's still in progress. And we said we would try and uh, spread the conversation, widen the conversation beyond UCD, which is, of course, all about what today's conference is. And of course, then, as we draw to the close of this phase of our initiative, what we want to do is to produce a roadmap of recommendations for UCD as we move forward as to how to try and make our research culture better. And I think the inspiration for us to do that is that research culture and a healthy and a positive research culture underpins both research integrity, but also research excellence. And in starting our initiative, we were inspired particularly by two organizations. First of all, by the University of Glasgow, who've been working in this area for quite a long time. Uh, and they were very generous with us in sharing some of their methodology and their thinking, and we talked to them extensively. And then secondly, also by Queen's University in Belfast, and I'm delighted to say that Wendy McLoon from Queen's is here to tell you a little bit about the great work they have done in Queen's. Uh, and I think, again, it was our colleagues in Glasgow who said to us, you know, research culture is important because what it does, as well as protecting integrity and protecting excellence, is it allows more researchers, a greater proportion of researchers, to reach that excellence benchmark that we all want to and aspire to have in our institutions and in, in our organizations. So we're still at an early stage of the process, and we're delighted again to have you all here today from your different organizations, and we very much want to make this a participatory conference. We want lots of discussion, lots of questions. We've got a little bit of, of time um, because unfortunately one of our speakers this afternoon has pulled out. So that will give us uh, the opportunity to have this dynamic discussion. And a really important part of the conference then will be our final session, which will be a panel discussion uh, at four o'clock. Um, when again, we will be putting questions to people at different uh, research stages in different positions or in organizations. And again, we encourage you to be part of that conversation. Anita McGuire, who chairs the National Research uh, Integrity Forum, was originally due to chair this panel. Unfortunately, uh, she can't be with us today. We've got a very able chair uh, in Jennifer Brennan, who's the co-chair of the National Forum, who has um, thankfully stepped in. Um, and um, Anita and Jennifer have encouraged us to come away with, uh, from today, and particularly from the panel discussion, with a couple of actionable items that we can all agree with and that we can all, I think, support um, as to what might be a good way to advance research culture in Ireland. So again, thank you all for coming. Um, we are really grateful again to see such a great attendance. Um, we want you to uh, enjoy the day as much as you can. Uh, I know the weather's nice outside, so you know, do take a little bit of time at lunch to go for a walk around Stevens Green and clear out the cobwebs. 
There is internet in the room. You have um, Edurome uh, and also a Academy One as the password for the local network. So make sure and use our hashtag here, Research Culture, if you want to tweet about the conference and, and what you hear today. Help us to spread the conversation. Um, I think the, the screen is a little bit dim here today. We're going to see if we can adjust the, the lighting to make it a little bit better. Um, and again, thank you for putting up with us. We didn't print lanyards or badges for everyone in the interest of sustainability. And equally, we didn't print out the program because presumably you all have at least one electronic device with you that you can access it on. So I think that's the spirit of today. And we are going to leave the fire door open to increase ventilation because of, I guess, the continuing concerns about respiratory infections that shall be nameless. So uh, I think uh, that's all I have to say. Adrian, would you like to add anything? I thought what I might do is just give a sort of personal experience of what it has been like running the Research Culture Initiative in, in, in UCD, just to give a different angle on this than the, sort of the, the aspirations to the day-to-day. The, the -day. So I think I've been very lucky. I've been around UCD long enough that I've made contacts across the university throughout the arts, humanities, social sciences. Uh, I suppose we expected everyone to be really thrilled that there was going to be a research culture initiative in UCD. But in fact, my co some of my colleagues were sufficiently kind to provide criticisms. <laughs> uh, some of them were generous, uh, uh, very helpful in the sense it was a, uh, you did a great idea, but you're doing it all wrong. Here's how I would have done it. And that has been incredibly useful. One of the things we accidentally done is because of the origin, we had two scientists as being the two academics on the Research Conference Committee. Colleen comes from an arts and humanities background, but uh, there was no academic member. So we were delighted when Ivor and Sonia joined us on the team. And that, that really is a lesson we should have thought of. Uh, it's one I, I'm passing on now. Something to take care of. The other one was much, sorry, was much was much blunter, which is research culture in UCD is awful. It's all UCD researchers' fault. You're associated with UCD research. We're not having anything to do with it. Uh, so there's nothing you can do with that at this stage. What we did, we we're going to go back, we we're going to make recommendations. Hopefully we we're going to have converts. But it is something to be aware of. You're not always going to be, uh, to be welcome, uh, everything with, with open arms. So if I can go on to the things we did, we, we did the survey. It's important to do a survey because we need to uh, benchmark the progress we're making. Uh, again, you hear Christians, how much money did UCD waste on consultants doing that survey? The answer was none, it was done by us, Jill and Collie especially, and they'll, they'll tell you about it. The other important thing about the survey is it provided a background in which to set up these world cafes. The thing that has been the most important to me in the research culture initiative has been these world cafes and Colleen who, who organized them is, has, has, been a fan, has done a fantastic job in doing so. And the, one of the things that, echoing that second unanswerable criticism, one of the things that quickly became clear is that it was important to the people in the World Cafe that while we had funding from kindly provided by UCD Research, because Grace and I had come from positions where by statute, I guess, the Vice President for Research couldn't tell us what to do because research integrity is, has to be investigated independently. We came with that same independence into research culture. There was never any pressure from us uh, to, to take this in a particular direction. And that was something that was particularly important, it became clear, in these cafe conversations for the participants to understand. So they would open up much more when they, when they realized that. Uh, and we learned an awful lot. I, I was involved with something called the Complex and Adaptive Systems Laboratory in UCD. And one thing I learned is that research culture around UCD is a very complex and adaptive system. You introduce a new scheme with every best intention and you find that that scheme is not only 
causing friction for the people in the scheme, but also the people in the scheme, uh, people outside this, people both inside and outside the scheme feel that there are, it's, it's created in inequalities. So we introduce Ad Astra Fellows, but they feel they're disadvantaged in some ways, people outside that feel they're disadvantaged in some ways. I, I would never have discovered that but for these world cafes. And I should say what is wonderful is we are producing a report and those reports are going to go back to the people that matter. And I've been incredibly impressed how interested everybody in UCD research, everybody in UCD HR are in the results. Poor Colleen is constantly fending off phone calls. So what, is that report ready yet? Is that report ready yet? There is a real interest to implement change on the back of the independent things that we've done. Uh, and probably the most touching moment of the whole research culture initiative was when we ran a world cafe for the technical offices. We'd, we had mixed attendance. We ran this one, the room was full. And Colin sort of, sort of, sort of general chatter at the beginning. It's great to see so many of you. Why is that? And they said because nobody's ever asked us before. And that really struck me as really why we were doing the uh, the research culture initiative. So those are just a few a few lessons that uh, I, I wanted to share. Uh, I think I think with that I would just sort of hand over to to any questions. We've got a couple of minutes for questions, if there are any. Oops. Or we, if people want to hold their, oh, there's one question there. Yes, thanks. Just because one person told me it's all this research culture is awful and it's all UC research, also UCD research certainly does not mean I have come away with that view. It's come away, I've come away with the view that we need to reach those people and convince them that they're, yes, there are issues, but I think the results of our survey were remarkably positive. Uh, uh, and, and I think we just need to ensure that it's, it's that is felt across the university and there aren't these little pockets who aren't engaging. It's the ones who aren't engaging that are, are worrying. Uh. Yeah. I'm sorry, Peter, just to follow up, I think the real proof of the pudding will be in the next survey we do uh, to see have we moved the goalposts at all um, or you know are we just basically running to stand still and so we've got to wait unfortunately to see see what happens there but I know you, you and your colleagues in UCD research have been very involved and anxious to, to see the results so yes yeah, so I appreciate that. Sarah Nangle, I'm working in the research office in Trinity. Um, so just the, on the topic of the World Cafes, and you mentioned kind of giving that voice to the technicians and this being the kind of first time that their input was being kind of gathered. Can I ask, were the World Cafes organized so that different kind of job roles were consulted separately or was there interaction, say, between the academics and the technicians? And if, you know, if it was one approach rather than the other, what was the kind of uh, logic behind that? Them, we kept them separate, and I think that was particularly important actually for the technical officers because I think they wouldn't have shared everything they shared had, had it been a more mixed audience. And I have to say that we, we sort of told them first thing that everything that was said in the room stayed in the room. There would be nothing would be accredited to any particular individual. The, the ideas that they presented with us were minuted by... Colleen, who's, who's going to present on this later, and we'll produce a report on them. Uh, but I, I think we just felt we would get a, a more open response if we kept it to the, 
the individual groups. I don't know if you want to add to that, Grace. So just to add to that, yeah, we did for, um, as Adrian has said, do individual cafes for individual roles where we thought there were specific issues that they would want to discuss particularly. But we did hold a number of other cafes which were directed at research institutes um, and some for colleges and, and schools as well. So we kind of took that mixed and uh, match mix and match approach, I guess, and we were very interested in, in the research institutes and the different cultures that apply across some of the research institutes in UCD, so more of that and on. So it's another Sorry, question we're, back we're there. we're going to have to move on. Okay. That's okay. We'll catch you in the coffee break, yeah. Uh, thanks very much, yeah. Uh, sorry about that, folks, um, but uh, uh, we do need to move on um, to our next speaker. And also, I should have said at the outset that, uh, as Adrian alluded to, I'm from an arts and humanities background. I'm a historian, and I have to lecture in UCD at 12 o'clock, so I'm sticking to the clock, all right? <laughs> <laughs> Our next speaker is Dr. Wendy McLoon, who's going to talk to us about research culture at Queen's. She's Deputy Director of Research Services at Queen's University, Belfast, with responsibility for the strategic direction and leadership of professional support services uh, to improve the long-term quality of the university's research and research environment. Um, she was also, prior to that, uh, Head of Research Development, and prior to that, she lectured in chemical engineering at Queen's for eight years. So over to you, Wendy. Thank you very much. Is the microphone on? Yes. Uh, so I guess thank you to UCD colleagues for the opportunity uh, to come and talk about the changing research culture um, here at Queen's. So really just to, to start the presentation, um, I thought I'd provide a little bit of context around the UK uh, policy and landscape in this space. And I have to say the UK is probably slightly ahead of Ireland uh, in the research culture, culture journey. So across, uh, over the last number of years, there's been an increased focus on enhancing research, uh, research culture. And much of this um, comes at a time of significant investment in public, um, in, in R&D um, across the, the public sector, very much with the ambition of the UK achieving the goal of being a science superpower by 2030. But it's been very much recognised that to achieve this ambition, will require um, the recruitment of about an additional 1,550,000 uh, people into, into the sector, which very much will mean we will have to look at attracting individuals from a diverse range of, of backgrounds. But coupled with this, um, for several reasons, and some are, are outlined here, careers in, in research, particularly in universities, are not seen as, as, as very attractive. Things have been called out such as lack of research integrity, unhealthy power dynamics, for example, which really means that it's becoming a challenge for universities and the broader landscape to actually attract uh, new talent to deliver on, the, on this superpower ambition. And the broad consensus, I guess, across the sector is that cultural change is required at all levels. So it's required from government, from funders, from senior academics within the university, right through to um, PIs and, and lab managers. This slide really overviews some of the notable developments in this space over the last uh, three or so years. And I guess for all of us, um, the Wellcome Trust survey, which was published in January 2020, was probably a real um, eye-opener for us as to how poor the research culture actually is. And it called out a, a large number of, of issues uh, ranging from unhealthy competition and bullying harassment. And that really precipitated a lot of movement in the sector in, in, in regards to, to improving the research culture. In the UK, the government then published an R&D roadmap uh, a roadmap in, in July 2020. And as part of that, committed to publishing um, a people and culture strategy. Ottiline Laser um, took up the role as CEO of UKRI and from the outset she very much put uh, research culture and people at the heart of her agenda. 
And then for us in Queen's, as part of the Russell Group, uh, the Russell Group uh, group of universities have put a lot of emphasis and a lot have engaged in a lot of activity around research culture. There was an, a survey, they produced a report, and I guess more, more importantly, on a practical level, they have now produced a toolkit which members can now avail of um, and utilise in terms of moving forward with their, their research culture activities. As I mentioned, uh, the government have now uh, published a people and culture strategy, and that was uh, issued in July last year. And it's very much couched in this uh, ambition to attract the very best talent to the UK. It identifies uh, three particular pillars within the strategy and outlines a number of outcomes that we want to achieve, together with um, a number of actions and commitments in order to deliver on this ambition. The first pillar is around people and very much ensuring that we've got um, the, the right talent to deliver um, the very best research and innovation activity. Some of the actions that have been identified include uh, a new deal for PGR students. So very much looking at the environment in which PGR students operate and making sure it, it maximises the opportunity for them but also the deliver of their research. And that work is currently ongoing um, across the UK. In terms of culture, very much the ambition is to um, create a positive um, and inclusive and respectful culture where the contributions of everyone is recognised um, in terms of what they deliver in terms of our research endeavour. A number again of initiatives that have been identified including a good practice exchange, so allowing institutions to learn from, from each other in terms of initiatives that they may roll out. And then finally around talent ensuring that we can attract people from a diverse range of backgrounds. And one of the particular initiatives being looked at here is looking at, for example, our fellowship programmes. How do we, are they fit for purpose? Are they really trying to give our, our new, bright young talent the right ecosystem in which to deliver their research activity? So in that context, um, I'm now going to talk a little bit about what we have done um, in Queen's in terms of moving um, forward with our changing research culture. And I guess, as, as was described for UCD, back in February of 2020, we launched a virtual research culture a suggestion box across the entire university. So offering all staff the opportunity to call out the issues they saw with research culture, but importantly, coupled with that, allowing individuals to bring forth suggestions of initiatives and interventions that they thought, thought we could put in place in order to improve the culture. We then followed that up with uh, a few more, uh, a couple of online staff engagement events, which really allowed us to do a bit of a deep dive into some of the, the issues that were identified. And we got a really good um, participation in, in those events, mindful that this was in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, in September 2020, we then published a draft of our strategy. Um, and then put that out once again for consultation right across the university through various committees, various uh, representative groups and importantly with our unions as well. On the back of the Welcome Trust report that was published in January 2020, we then hosted jointly with Ulster University one of the, the uh, Welcome Trust Town Hall events. And really what that did was it allowed us to explore some of the issues that Welcome Trust had called out very much at a local level. And then all this uh, came together in January 2021 where we published our Research Culture Action Plan. And subsequently that has been embedded within our Research and, Cult or research and Innovation Strategy, which is part of our overall Corporate Plan Strategy 2030. So very much embedding this front and centre into everything we do around research and innovation. This slide really um, outlines our research culture action plan and I guess for us it was important to have a, an action plan really to raise the visibility of this activity, very much to show that, uh, to prioritise our actions and to show a timeline and a commitment of the things that we were going to deliver. It's very much a university commitment, it's owned by everyone and everyone is responsible for, for the delivery of it. It's a live document, and so we will dynamically change it depending on the changing um, internal environment, but also, and importantly, the external environment as well. Uh, I won't go through in detail the strategic priorities. It is available on our website if you want to have a look. Um, but we've called out priorities such as an inclusive and compassionate culture, congeniality and collaboration, 
supporting a diverse range of pathways, so not just the PIs, but looking at, at everything from technicians through to researchers, through to postdocs, uh, right through to the, the established PI. Creating a culture of uh, creativity and innovation, so ensuring we've got the right culture to allow our researchers to do the very best research that they can. And I think probably one of the most important priorities around reward and recognition, so ensuring the contributions of everyone across the university is recognised. And then we have a number of, of three cross-cutting themes, um, EDI, we very much called out COVID because obviously it has had huge implications on our research culture and then all of this is underpinned by delivering the very best research uh, quality and ambition. So what have we done so far? Whilst we published the strategy in January 21, it was really September before we began to deliver against it in earnest, for the most part due to the pandemic and something called the Research Excellence Framework, which occupies a lot of the time in, in the UK. So that, that was occupying our time. So we, we kind of deprioritized this uh, for the first part of 21. For year one, it was very much around awareness raising and achieving a few quick wins, so demonstrating to the community that we were actually uh, committed to, to, to move forward with some of the suggestions they had brought through. Um, one of the things we did was publish a website, and you can see uh, the link here. Uh, in the, on the website is very much a resource for individuals to access, keeps people up to date with the progress uh, against the delivery of our plan, um, and really, I guess, is visible externally to, to demonstrate to the wider community the, our commitment to, to this activity. Uh, some of the things that we did in year one uh, was to run a number of campaigns and events. Uh, one of those events focused on the stigma of failure. So we got a number of our senior academics to talk very openly about the failures they had had in their career and, and how they'd learnt from those, really trying to um, show early career academics in particular that it's okay to fail. We also did a showcase event uh, around the hidden support roles, so asking a number of individuals from across uh, the research and innovation landscape to talk about the role they had as, for example, a, a data management officer or a technician um, or an integrity officer, so really trying to, to raise the visibility and the importance of some of these roles. Probably one of the most significant developments of, of year one was the, the launch of our institutional postdoctoral uh, centre. And this is very much a one-stop shop for our postdoc or research community in terms of advice, guidelines and, and development opportunities. And that really builds on a pilot we had run in our, our medicine, health and life sciences uh, faculty previously. So really extending that, that uh, support structure across, across the university. We also worked uh, collaboratively with other institutions around the UK to develop a, a toolkit which allows um, discussion by non-academic uh, members of staff uh, around uh, the research culture so they can bring forth uh, their observations and their issues and concerns around research culture and, and discuss it in a very open and transparent way. We offered a research culture seed fund, so we had around £30,000, which we opened on a competitive basis uh, to allow individuals of whatever role uh, they had in the university to come forth with ideas of interventions that they wanted to trial within their particular unit or their particular school um, to enhance our research culture. We funded about, I think it's about 15 awards, um, and some examples included um, a writing retreat for, uh, for academics of Af African heritage. So really trying to, at the grassroots, implement some new initiatives. We, we plan to publicise those through a best practice exchange to see uh, how they could be then rolled out to other areas across the university. We've also been looking at streamlining research bureaucracy. This was a, a, a thread um, that came through the, the uh, suggestion box. So we have revised our committee structure, um, got rid of a number of committees that we felt were, were not needed, um, but importantly looked at the membership of our committees to ensure that they were truly reflective of the entire community. So for example, brought a, a representative from the technicians um, to sit on our research and innovation committee and we consolidated a number of our internal funds. Academics often said they didn't know which fund to go to to, to, to support a, a particular um, initiative, etc. So we've brought them all, all under one overarching agility fund. 
sitting alongside the Research Culture Action Plan, which uh, interestingly is, has actually run out of research and enterprise within, within Queen's. We have another, a number of other initiatives um, that very much are, are, are being rolled out um, and implemented to enhance research culture. Within the UK, there is a, a technician's commitment to which Queen's has, is a signatory. And to support that, we have a three-year action plan which very clearly articulates our commitments um, around enhancing the contribution of our technicians, both to research but also to, to the education uh, programmes within the university. And this year in May, they ran a, sh uh, a showcase really to increase the visibility of the contributions they make across the sector. We have a fellowship academy which was launched in January 2020 and it continues to provide support to our um, prestigious fellowship holders, both internal and external fellowship holders. And that's an uh, initiative run jointly between our People and Culture Directorate and Research and Enterprise. So again, very much building on that cross institutional uh, contributions to this area. And more recently, we have invested in an open research team um, within our library, again, to drive forward this agenda at PACE. Looking forward then to, to year two, the year we're currently in, I guess for us this year, we're making a shift to very much delivering tangible institutional change. So moving from the quick wins to tackling some of the bigger uh, challenges that we have. And again, I've outlined some of the priorities here. I guess first and foremost, it's about looking at our, the careers of our researchers, so our postdoc and research fellows. And, and putting in place a dedicated research uh, career pathway where individuals can move between the grades as our teaching staff or our teaching and research staff can, can currently do. So a very much a focus on our, our research community and also looking at our appraisal process or our personal development review process for that cohort. Currently they're, I guess, lumped in with professional support staff and their PDR process is not fit for purpose for that cohort. We'll also continue to roll out the narrative CV as part of our progression and pr uh, probation processes, really trying to position our um, academic colleagues in particular um, for the changes that are fit with, uh, in terms of our research funders. In terms of responsible research, again, we will continue to deliver on this agenda, really, um, I guess, doubling down on our commitment about the responsible use of metrics. And then across the UK, there's a number of other initiatives that are ongoing um, and research agendas such as trusted research. So we'll continue again to roll those out, but very much looking at those through a research culture lens. I mentioned that one of the uh, priorities in terms of the strategy uh, or our action plan is EDI. And so this year, we will look to build upon our various Athena Swan accreditations and our commitment to the Race Equality Charter. So really trying to look at uh, and unpick the issues that we have at Queen's in this space and to develop effective interventions uh, in support of those. In order to practically deliver on this, uh, we have secured um, a part-time FTE to drive this agenda forward and establish a, a small internal working group from across the, the university, really to try to bring forth um, and, and understand all of the issues that, that exist in this space. Reward and recognition, again, the key focus here is around uh, the credit taxonomy. So ins ensuring that all individuals within a research team are adequately um, credited for the contribution they're making to a particular publication. We've just launched uh, a new um, research and innovation professionals network. And this is the first year of rollout. And we have um, within, and this is a, a university uh, wide initiative. And we already have around 80 members and had our first meeting of that, of that network actually last week. So, really good uh, participation and real excitement to build connectivity across the university in this space. We'll continue with our um, ambitions around reducing research bureaucracy. And I guess from the UK perspective, there was a recent uh, Takale review which looked at research bureaucracy across the whole sector. So we'll very much look to draw on that, and in particular, the, the areas that were identified as, as um, falling to the institutions to implement. And then underpinned, uh, underpinning all of that, we will continue to build awareness through our website and other uh, mechanisms, and to build uh, networks and connectivity with the likes of our colleagues in UCD to really learn uh, and, and share best practice in this space. So just to finish off, I thought I'd share, a, a, I guess, a few reflections of our experience to date. 
I guess none of the, these are all, I, I think, fairly obvious, but I think it's useful just to, to bring them all together. So for us, the commitment of government and, and funders in this space has been critical. Without that, I think we would have struggled to really get traction uh, at an institutional level to move this forward. Equally then, at an institutional level, as, as UCT colleagues have already described, having the, the buy-in from senior, senior leadership is key. And in our case, it's, it's our PVC for research, Professor Emma Flynn. She very much has this at, as one of the top things on her agenda. But to make this a success, uh, delivery must be genuinely owned by the research community. There's no point in you know, the of a, a top-down approach. It equally has to be bottom-up. We all have similar issues, um, maybe some very unique pieces, but there's a lot of um, ability to draw on best practice from across the sector. And, and we have done that, and in particular, I think it was cited that Glasgow is, I guess, one of the leaders in this field. We have worked closely with Glasgow on a number of initiatives, which we have then embedded in Queen's. For us, it's about prioritise, prioritising things that will have the, the biggest impact. There's so much to do, but really focusing in on those um, areas which make the biggest impact. And that's the benefit of having an action plan, because you really will call those out. The community is diverse, so it's ensuring that we engage with everyone at all stages of the processes. Whether that's the postdocs, whether that's the, the research students, technicians, they all need to be um, co-equal partners in the development of an enhanced research culture. And as I mentioned, uh, cross-institutional collaboration is key, so working very closely in particular with our people and culture uh, directorate. And I've got two minutes, so my last slide, and, and I guess this is really posing a few questions uh, to you all. These are things that, that we are thinking about and, and don't have the answers. Um, but just to, to pose these questions, how do we measure and monitor our research culture enhancement? Obviously, it needs to be a longitudinal piece. We're thinking of pulse surveys, but you know, keen to hear from, from those in the room of, of any other um, mechanisms that they think would be appropriate. Beyond the lifetime of the, the plan, which ours is a three-year plan, how do we sustain an enhanced research culture? We don't get any funding from government to support this, unlike our colleagues in England, who, who are provided with um, core funding to deliver on research culture. So how, do we, how will we resource that, both in terms of money, but also in terms of staff time, et cetera? And how, we, how will we free up the time of academic colleagues, in particular, to do things like mentoring to enhance that culture? How do we really tackle some of the very pervasive challenges around academic workload? I think it, it exists across every institution. So how do we really free up time for academics to, to deliver on their, their very best research and also to develop, retain and attract the, the talent? And I think, I think one that we all struggle with, how do we keep up with the evolving strategies and priorities of government and funders? They're continually layering new things on top of us. So how do we balance business as usual with these new priorities as we move forward in the context of research culture? So with that, I will stop. I've put the link to our website here uh, and uh, an email address. Um, I, I can't take any credit for, th for this work. It's all led out of our research policy office. Um, so please direct any questions to them or myself um, in the future. Thank you. Thanks very much, Wendy. Uh, we'd have a couple of minutes for uh, questions if anyone has a, a burning question at this point in time. Yes, one down the back there. Um, Wendy, I was just trying to clarify um, in terms of... Thanks. Hi, I'm Irene Kavanagh. I'm from UCC Research Office. So I was just... Um, you mentioned there just in your last sentence that the research culture team at Queen's is run out of the research policy office. So in doing that, um, to drive the actions forward, did you also encompass, say, um, a working group made up of different areas that are involved in implementing actions like EDI and HR? H how did you operationalize the, the rollout of research culture? So we don't have an overarching um, research culture working group or, or gripping. We have taken the approach of identifying groups for specific initiatives. So for example, around the EDI work that we're engaging in, we have set up a small group within research and enterprise, but also drawing in colleagues from people and culture, et cetera, as, as the individuals who will be delivering on that particular part of the action plan. So, so I guess, the approach has been to look at a particular initiative and then draw in the appropriate individual. So more, more sort of a task and finish grip kind of approach around the particular initiatives that we want to drive forward. We can take one more question here. Thanks. 
Hi, uh, Wendy. I'm Jennifer Brennan from the National Research Integrity Forum. Um, you mentioned the REF. What impact do you think the REF has on research culture? Is it positive, negative, or neutral? Um, it's interesting in that I think it has had a positive um, impact, and quite often a number of the underlying components, for example, open research or the emphasis on EDI, have actually been driven by REF. So within REF, for those of you who are not aware, there's a research environment statement you have to write. So within that, you have to articulate your contributions around, or your, your I guess, response around EDI. Your, you talk about your commitment to your technicians, etc. So, so quite often, REF has actually been one of the positives has been to actually drive some of these larger initiatives around open research, etc. Okay, if if we can hold questions, uh, other questions for Wendy to later on. Just like to thank Wendy for a fascinating uh, introduction to the whole research culture initiative at Queens. And our, our final speaker for this first session this morning is James Morris, who's going to talk to us perspectives on research culture across the European research area. Uh, James is a senior policy officer at Science Europe, leading work on the topics of research culture and research assessment. Uh, he jo joined Science Europe in 2019 and has been involved in studies on research assessment practices, the development of positions and recommendations aimed at improving conditions for researchers and the research activity. Uh, and he also has a background in marine and molecular biology and a strong interest in science communication. So over to you, James. Thank you very much. Um, I'm delighted to be here today. Thank you for the invitation. Um, and as I said, I'm going to be talking about research culture um, and presenting some differing but also common perspectives on the topic from across the European research area. A little bit first about Science Europe. Um, so we're the association of major research funding and performing organizations in Europe. And we have 40 members from 30 countries, which each year collectively contribute over 20 billion euros to the research um, ecosystem within the European research area. Our members include for instance, in Ireland, um, the Science Foundation Ireland, the Health Research Board, and the Irish Research Council, um, and equivalent funders all across Europe, such as the German Research Foundation, um, and as well, a number of performing organizations at national levels, including the Spanish National Research Council. And what we try and do is bring together both the persp perspectives of uh, national public funders and also uh, national performers. Science Europe has been around for 11 years. Um, and last year, in 2021, we published a new strategy plan for the coming period. Um, our mission has remained basically the same over the whole 11-year period, which is to define uh, long-term perspectives for European research and champion best practice approaches, all in the name of supporting high quality research and impactful research, um, and doing so for the benefit of everybody. In our new strategy plan, we have three priority areas. Um, the first of which is to shape European research policy developments. And the second, and the area that I lead our work on, is to contribute to the evolution of research culture. Uh, and that is what I'll speak about today. And we have a third priority, uh, another new focus for us, which is about tackling societal challenges and, and the role of science in contributing to that. Our work mainly focuses on five action areas. So firstly, it's about sharing, so bringing together research funders and performers in Europe, sharing best practices, promoting mutual learning. It's about aligning on policies and practices where that is beneficial and relevant, but I think importantly for this presentation and these discussions around research culture, it's also about supporting diversity of practices and different pathways where that's important. We need to recognize that it's not a one-size-fits-all model when we're considering the whole European uh, landscape. We promote collaboration uh, amongst our members 
and with the research community and other stakeholders. Um, and we also do work on advocacy and outreach. So research culture became a new topic for us last year. And I think one of the first questions we had when um, our members came back to us and said they'd be interested in, in research culture was what, what do we mean by research culture? Um, we didn't know, many of our members weren't sure or had different perspectives. Um, and we came across this really nice illustration from the Royal Society. Um, it's an illustration from a set of workshops that they held in, in 2018, and it highlights the diversity of meanings around research culture. Um, just to highlight some of the aspects of that, research culture can be about the research process, it's about people and careers, it can be about open science, it's about recognition and collaboration and collegiality. Um, and so we took this broad um, illustration as a starting point and we began discussing with our members, we set up a working group on the topic of research culture. Um, and our starting point was the Royal Society definition that research culture encompasses the behaviors, values, expectations, attitudes, and norms of research systems. Uh, and importantly for Science Europe, research culture is a vital consideration for all of our policy and practice developments. Every time we think about changes to policies, for instance, in open science, we should think about the effect that they may have on the behaviors of researchers um, and the links to other policy areas as well. So it's about gaining a, uh, an overview of how changes in one policy topic can affect changes in another. But before we started thinking about research culture, um, our work was focused more on assessment. And I suppose this, for research funding agencies, this is a way um, of uh, one of their influence areas on research culture. And it's also a, a big topic for Science Europe um, since we began, because it's a core activity of both research funding organizations through grant allocation but also research performing organizations in career progression exercises such as hiring and promotion. Assessment uh, affects many aspects of the research landscape uh, and influences how research is conceived, performed, and disseminated. Um, and at Science Europe, we've looked at the topic from various angles over the past decade, from discussions on research impact to peer review and innovations in peer review to gender equality. Um, we brought this all together in 2019 when I first started working at Science Europe uh, by conducting an extensive study of assessment practices of research organizations. The objective of which was to understand how research organizations can select the best projects for funding and the best researchers for career progression and how they do so in fair, transparent, effective, and efficient ways. Um, we asked around 35 questions, um, but I'm just gonna highlight a few of the key um, bits of output that we got from this survey. So firstly, we asked organizations what their understanding of research quality was. Um, and in 2019, over half of the responding organizations said that they did not have a formal definition of research quality. And this is quite natural because research quality is very context dependent within a funding organization. It can be program dependent um, and it's inherently difficult to define. But we did find a number of commonalities in what they understood as research quality. So novelty and originality of research ideas was deemed very important by the majority, as was methodological rigor and academic significance. To a lesser extent, productivity and non-academic significance was also mentioned uh, in 2019. We asked research organizations what challenges they face when they implement their assessment processes. Um, there were many, but there were four common responses that we heard a lot. Firstly was that uh, organizations dedicate uh, 
a lot of effort to continually trying to combat all forms of bias, discrimination and unfair treatment. Secondly, that there's a lot of pressure exerted on organisations by limited funds and limited positions, and this makes distinguishing the many high-quality applications that they receive very difficult. Thirdly, the cost and efficiency of assessment systems is a major challenge um, for everyone involved, and this is particularly the case as we move towards more qualitative uh, assessment procedures, and that's a point I'll, I'll come back to later. And fourthly, research organisations were concerned with the uh, effort and time burden placed on both applicants and reviewers and also their own staff. Um, and that's particularly true considering the public nature of the funding that, that our members receive. More specifically, we looked at the approaches and tools that are used by reviewers as part of um, the assessment uh, processes that, that our funding agencies and performing agencies use. And we found um, some commonalities, but some differences. Firstly, in common, um, qualitative assessment was already in 2019 the most predominantly used approach. And those that used it, 81% of our respondents found it a very important part of their assessment procedures. But speaking of the diversity of approaches to assessment and to research culture, we found that there was a split in organisations between those that used quantitative metrics and deemed them in an important part of their process and those that had never used them and weren't planning to do so in the future. We then also asked about the community level or bottom-up initiatives that were influencing policies and practices of our research organisations. And we found at the time that over 50% of our respondents were already signatories of DORA, the San Francisco Declaration on Research Assessment, and other initiatives such as the Leiden Manifesto and the Hong Kong Principles were also regularly cited. Um, and that these community level initiatives were really important in driving changes to, to policies and practices at research organization level. We took the results of this study uh, and in 2020 we produced a set of recommendations, 27 recommendations on assessment processes that covered seven topics as you can see in this slide. I'm not going to go through each of them but I think they're still very relevant today um, and they produce a, a best practice model for how you can run assessments within research organisations uh, under the current system. But I think the study and our recommendations um, gave us a, an overall impression of, of, of the system within which we are all a part. Um, and that is that assessment processes are mostly effective, so they can select for quality. Um, but there are many issues, many issues and many challenges, and those issues and challenges create a lot of strain. Um, in the face of these challenges, research organisations uh, change their policies and practices periodically and do evaluate them as they do, but these changes generally take place quite slowly and are incremental. Uh, and that's natural because there's a lot of risk associated with it. If you make a big change to an assessment process for early career researchers uh, and there are unintended consequences, that can have a, an effect on a whole co cohort of researchers. So as I said, we thought that our recommendations were um, a, a gold standard model for how assessment processes can be run, but we recognised that actually broader reform was needed. And it wasn't just reform to re from research organisations perspective that we needed to um, consider reform at all levels and include the research community and include governments and include publishers in these discussions. Um, and that was really where this idea of research culture popped up for Science Europe. So how do we engage, how do we connect our discussions on research policy to the research community, to the behaviours of researchers? We were not the only ones to be doing this kind of work. Um, there were many other initiatives going on in the last couple of years. Um, I'll just highlight the European University 
association study, they're close partners of ours in Brussels. They also conducted a study on research assessment in 2020 and also um, came to the conclusion that reform was needed. Um, and as I mentioned, there were many community level initiatives like DORA, also like the Research on Research um, Institute who did a, a, a nice policy paper on the role of and responsibility of funders in research assessment. So by the end of 2020, I think there was a really a strong voice from all aspects of the research community saying we need reform of research assessment and we need to consider the interconnectivity um, of different stakeholder levels. Um, and we thought we should do this by considering research culture. So we went back to our members, and this was the point where we had the term research culture, but we didn't really know what it meant or what direction we should take. So we did a scoping study with our members, and we asked them what their organization understood from research culture, whether they already had a working definition. And we found that uh, only about a third of our members um, at the start of last year had already started working on research culture. So it was a new topic for them as well. We asked them to describe elements of what they thought an ideal culture would be within their national system. Uh, and we got this nice word cloud, which I think um, really nicely connects to the Royal Society illustration that I showed at the start. Many, many common themes that, that showed that actually there, there was uh, commonalities between different levels of discussion on research culture. So things like equal opportunities, diversity, broader recognition, open science, research careers were all, all, all deemed important by our members um, in the research culture that we are working towards. We also asked who are the important drivers of research culture change. Um, and the overwhelming response was that everybody should be involved in these changes. But we also saw, as you can see here, the signal that it really should be led by the community. So it should be bottom up from researchers, from research performing organizations with the support of funders uh, and governments and decision makers. And that speaks to the naming of our strategic priority, why we said at Science Europe we want to contribute to the evolution of research culture. We don't want to, to lead those activities. Um, and we committed at that point to always engaging with researchers every time we were having discussions on research uh, culture. Uh, and that is why uh, I'm delighted to be here to, to continue these discussions um, with you as members of the research community. Following that scoping study, we decided to uh, develop a statement and come together as an association of funders and performers to release a vision of research culture within the European research area. Um, and that was that all participants in the research endeavor should be appropriately recognized for their diverse contrib contributions. Broad skills and competencies should be fostered and they would do so through suitable training and appropriate infrastructure uh, and through responsible management and governance. Research integrity and high ethical standards need to be promoted and careers within the research sector are attractive and sustainable. So I hope those points resonate with you, but we recognize that making these vision statements is easy, actually implementing them is, is much more difficult, uh, and that brings us up to this year and the work that we've been trying to do with our members and with the research community. But I'll take you back to one of my first slides, back to the original definition when we were thinking about how to make that vision a reality, we wanted a starting point where we could say, do we have some common ground from which we can discuss policies and practice changes at research organization level? And we thought that values would be one of those uh, points where we could get some common ground. So uh, in July this year, we published a 
Science Europe values framework. We think that values underpin research culture and lie at the center of research systems. Um, and despite them being really important and everybody um, is very willing to, to discuss values, they're often presumed and unwritten. And so what we wanted to do was write them down. We wanted a shared reference point, which we could have as a foundation for appraisal and adaptation, and to which we could go to the community and say, do you think these values are currently well represented from your perspective? And if not, how can we make changes? So we came together uh, around six values. Firstly, autonomy and freedom, care and collegiality, collaboration, equality, diversity and inclusion, integrity and ethics, openness and transparency. We think that these together give a new understanding of what research quality should be. Research quality should incorporate all of these uh, and that research processes and activities and management and governments should all try to make sure that these are um, promoted through policies and practices. Um, and since we released this values framework uh, a few months ago, we've been going to the research community and asking, do you think these values are reflected from your perspective? Do you have ideas for how they can be uh, embedded in, in your work better? And we found, unsurprisingly, that uh, in some cases these values are reflected, but in many cases they're not, particularly around, for instance, collaboration, the idea of uh, principal authors or principal investigators, uh, first authors, doesn't speak to collaboration, particularly in the more complex research and team science that, that we're all doing now. Um, so that would be a conversation that I'd really like to have with, with anybody here about how we embed those values better. And my last slide, just very quickly to mention that Science Europe is also involved in a reform of research assessment initiative. This is a joint endeavor between Science Europe, the European University Association and the Commission. Um, and it's an agreement that was published in, on the 20th of July earlier this summer that sets a shared direction for changes to assessment of research, research uh, researchers and performing organizations and sets out a number of commitments. An important part of this agreement will be culture change. It will be about giving space for changes in behavior as part of those reform processes. Um, and we're now working to get as many organizations involved in this agreement and the eventual coalition. And from Science Europe's perspective, we think this is a um, potentially a very powerful movement that builds on other community initiatives like DORA, like the Leiden Manifesto. And um, with that, I will end. James, <coughs> that's great. Many thanks, James. We have a couple of minutes for a couple of quick questions before we break. Uh, yes. Hi, Peter Scott from UCD. So my question is about sort of diversity of research cultures, because a, a lot of the conversation seems to suggest that we're striving towards one universal research culture. And I think we're at a certain point in the journey now where there's a lot of consensus around what some good practice might be and what are the bad practices that we want to stamp out. And maybe that is sort of a universal set of values. But at a certain point then, when we've solved those problems, there's going to be things where there isn't as much consensus and different maybe disciplines, different research groups, different institutions are, are going to want to take different takes on these things. So is that the point at which institutional quality programs stop and you just leave it up to individuals to develop their own practices? Or is there going to be a role for institutional research culture work as we start to diversify and things aren't so clear cut and there aren't as many sort of purely consensus driven initiatives? I think that's a, a very good question and that's why we focused on values because we didn't want to try and make one research culture but we thought that actually values was the level at which we could find some commonality and below that we then let different pathways um, and different uh, organizations and institutes take their own direction. My example on collaboration about the uh, principal investigator role and, and versus team science that is true for many disciplines, but there are still disciplines where single researchers do their work 
So we need to recognize that as part of the diversity approaches to research, uh, research culture. Um, I don't know at what level that um, alignment and commonality reaches and at which point um, the diversity of, of pathways takes over. Um, but we're very conscious that we, we don't want to create a single uh, research culture within Europe, that we need, to, we need to promote a diversity of pathways within that. We can take one more question over there. Thank you. Uh, Kalpana Shankar, University College Dublin. I really enjoyed your talk. Uh, one of the elephants in the room that you didn't really allude to, which is having an enormous impact on research culture, I think, in Europe and elsewhere, is the for-profit sector around research. We could be talking about the publishers. We could be talking about consultants that are making a metric crap ton of money advising on these things like grant calls and so forth. How are we going to manage that? Everything I see around our infrastructures, our evaluative processes, et cetera, are all being driven on some invisible level by this you know, privatization of our research cultures. Thank you. I think that's a, a, a really uh, good question and a very tricky one, and I think we would solve a lot of the problems if, if any of us had the answer to that at the moment. Um, I think uh, in my last slide, the, the reform initiative is something that's really powerful. Um, it's about getting a critical mass of the research community to say either in the case of uh, Plan S or Coalition S, we don't want um, these kind of models of, of, of publications and paywalls. We don't want research assessment to be reliant on prestige and journals and um, performing organizations to have to rely on university rankings. I think the reform of research assessment agreement can be a way of getting that critical mass to say, together, we want to make a change in this direction. Um, beyond that, I think, uh, I, I don't know what else I would recommend. <laughs> <laughs>